everyone. This is Whitney Young, HGA's program coordinator, coming to you with another round of Thread Talks. This hour will feature three wonderful presentations, about 15 minutes each. Um, and if you were joining us last session, I know Kathy had made the introduction that Marilyn Ramaka had been added to Thread Talks, and she has. She will just be a part of the six o'clock hour tonight. So if you haven't already registered for that session, make sure you register for the 6 p.m. Eastern edition of Thread Talks. And it looks like we have all our attendees on board. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it over to Marcy Petrini, who's gonna be telling us about how to make a unique project. Take it away, well, Marcy. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my studio. Thank you for having me. Uh, I would like to talk briefly about how I go about um, planning a project, and I will share my screen here so you can see my um, slides. Okay, so there are probably as many um, new way of planning a project as there are weavers, but I would like to share uh, what I do and hopefully you will get some ideas from this. So when I start a project, I like to uh, think of the projects being in, uh, or the beginning being in four broad categories. I may start with a piece that I want to weave. I may have a special yarn that I want to use. I may be studying a weaving structure or sometimes um, uh, the surroundings make me uh, think about something that I would like to uh, be inspired by. So let's talk about um, what I'm going to, what, what am I going to weave? I have been weaving for a long time. So I have a house full of um, textiles. And as you know, they're very durable. I don't sew much, but I uh, actually I don't sew at all th these days, but um, I do weave a lot of uh, textiles from home or have over the years. And so I don't need a whole more uh, blankets and, and uh, pillows and so forth. But once in a while, I do need uh, a new, uh, table runner or towels. So when I start with an item, I have to think, well, okay, what is it that I want to do? And what size do I want to make it? And then I have to make all the other decisions, the yarn, which of course includes the fiber and color, the weaving structure, and finally how I'm going to finish it, which is both dry and wet finishing. So here um, you may have heard the um, saying that art doesn't have to match your couch. Well, the nice thing about our fiber art is that we have total control over it. So yes, we can make the, our fiber art to match our house. And here's an example. We have a bathroom, our guest bathroom, which is called the uh, purple sheep bathroom. The sheep are in purple, but the bathroom is. And we have a sink that was made by a local potter and I commissioned a tile artist, friend of mine, to make uh, tiles. And I told her that they needed to be purple and they needed to have sheep. And so she designed these and I couldn't pick which one I wanted. So all three of them appear. You can see them here above the sink, all around the room, uh, alternating with plain purple. Eventually my uh, towels, my guest bathroom towels wore out. So it was time to make some new ones. So I decided to take the two colors that are predominant in the bathroom, uh, green and purple. And I dyed some cotton, both for the warp and for the weft. And I wanted the, uh, each towel to be different. And so you can see here that sometimes the stripes fall in nicely, sometimes not so. And I, I like the randomness, each towel is uh, unique. Sometimes I start um, my uh, projects with a, uh, with a yarn. With the yarns, I don't stash a whole lot of yarns. I have favorite vendors that can get me yarn here quickly if I uh, need it. But if I'm choosing a yarn first, I have all the same questions that I have uh, starting with it from another uh, place. What's the optimal item to make with this yarn? Do I have, if I have the yarn, do I have enough or can I get more or can I add other yarns to make whatever I have in mind? And if I don't have the yarn, if it's a yarn that I'm thinking about that I've seen, then I need to know how much to buy. And then of course, with what structure is ideal for this yarn and the item and how will the items that I make from this yarn be finished? One of the things that I like to do with yarns is when I travel, if I find a yarn store is I like to buy them because they make the best souvenirs. 
And there's nothing better than um, yards from convergence as souvenirs of convergence. So these are um, five out of the six souvenirs, uh, as a lot of the six convergence, less convergences. And uh, I can't find 2010, 12, but it's somewhere in the slides um, back uh, in the other computer. But here was Tampa Bay, some nice cotton. Uh, here is uh, um, some bamboo, and then we have tencel and silk. And uh, this one, the last one is the um, tencel and uh, silk combined. Um, 22, uh, 22 uh, silk and 10 two tencels are not identical in size, but close, and so they work well together. Sometimes I like to start um, my um, project from a structure. That's often because I'm studying the structure or I'm going to be um, teaching it. So I need to be thinking about it. So my questions then becomes, am I familiar with the structure? For example, am I going to weave a twill that I never won be, uh, uh, never woven before, but I'm familiar with twills? In that case, if I'm familiar broadly with the uh, group of, the, of structures, then I can uh, find or think about what that um, structure is well matched for uh, in terms of final product. And if not, then will I be making a sample first? Well, yes, I'm a big believer in making samples to avoid um, disasters on the line. And then there is all the other questions have to be answered. What, what yarn will showcase the structure and uh, finishing and all those good things. Then I have three reasons that I usually start uh, with a structure, a uh, project with a structure. One is that a structure is new to me, even though I've been weaving for a long, long time, um, there are still structures out there that are new. I have a Pictionary, which is an online uh, free resource and I'll give you the link there. It's on my website. And um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But a lot of times a structure new to me also ends up being added to the Pictionary. Actually, the Pictionary has been a great reason why I started looking for structures that I never woven before. And again, then I do structures and repeat some, uh, some samples if I'm going to be uh, teaching or writing. So a few years back, I was going through um, some old SSNDs. I think it was for to write a 50 um, anniversary um, uh, article. And I came across this article on Canale. And I first made a sample and I really liked the, the way that the, um, the supplementary yarns float on top of the um, ground cloth. So I made this little shawl, which I thought was really fun to wear. And more recently, I came across uh, a weave called Overshot Pattern Double Weave. Actually, a friend of mine had uh, shown me some um, samples that she made in a workshop and didn't really make it into my consciousness, consciousness until Robin Spady uh, wrote a wonderful, um, actually, the most entire uh, issue of Heddlecraft on Overshot Pattern Double Weave. As you can uh, uh, deduce from the title, you start with an overshot pattern. So here I picked the simplest overshot pattern that I could find, block A, B, C, D, uh, C, B, and A again. So you see the little diamonds. And then you weave it, and, and Robin has uh, great directions for how to go about doing this. And so here's the front of the cloth. This is the back of the cloth. Because it's double weave, uh, it is a little bit heavier, so we'll make a great pillow. Haven't done that yet, but one day. Here's an entry from the, uh, from the Pictionary. This happens to be deflected double weave on four shafts. So all the structures, at least so far, are on four shafts. And it's literally what the title sounds like. It's a um, dictionary with a picture, a brief description of the, uh, of the weave, a, a drawdown if it's applicable. You know, Lino wouldn't have a drawdown. Uh, and then uh, photos, always photo of a sample. In this case, because this is differential shrinkage, the photos are before, you know, right off the loom and after um, wet finishing. Sometimes the, the photos are front and back of the fabric, um, actually like you saw with the uh, overshot pattern double weave. And um, if it's the front and the back is the same, then, then we just have the front. And then uh, some information about the weave. Each structure, as I said, is one page and it can be downloaded as a PDF. You can download one, you can download as many as you want. There's about, there's over 80. And finally, I sample for teaching. So um, in hopefully at Convergence 22, um, I will be offering a seminar on tied weaves. And this is uh, a project or, or a sample that I was weaving at the beginning of the year for the Convergence that was supposed to be this year. So um, it's just a simple um, 
structure combination of, of blocks and I will be doing, and I have, I've done more. This is just one example of that. Locally, I was teaching about turn drafts. Actually, I wrote a couple blogs on it. And here is turns monks belts and uh, monks belts is a um, supplementary weft structure. So when you turn it, this becomes your supplementary warp. And um, then you can use it. Um, you, it's more flexible when it's turned. Uh, and finally, this uh, sample to the right was on a was woven on a rigid heddle. And um, after the sample, I wove a scarf, and uh, hopefully it will be in uh, SSND issue 204 uh, from the right from the start that I write, which is going to be uh, primarily in rigid heddle weaving. So the, um, the sampling for weaving and writing keeps me busy. And finally, um, nature of my surroundings uh, inspire me and it's another way to have a souvenir, if you will. So here is uh, um, the uh, beautiful tree that turned, obviously, fall. We don't have fall in, uh, um, or we have fall, but we don't have fall colors in Mississippi. So it's always a treat to go places where the leaves turn. And this was in Asheville last year. Uh, gold, beautiful gold leaves and uh, the sun shining through it. So when I start with an inspiration, it's usually because of the color. So I have to first, I have to ask myself, what yarn is, um, am I going to use with fiber um, that I can get in those colors or, or perhaps dye? And then what item can capture my vision? I weave primarily scarves and shawls because I find them that there are almost like a canvas. I can repeat the pattern, the colors can, can develop. And so, I, and then I get to wear it. And then also there is, of course, I have to choose a structure. This is a picture um, from Tamikula, uh, California, which is a small uh, wine growing area in Southern California. You can see the mountains in the back, you can see the vineyards in the front, and they have a hot air balloon rise every morning, uh, weather permitting, in the fog. And you can see those beautiful colors and stripes. So here are some pieces that I have made from inspiration. This actually, the first one on the uh, left here was a postcard. Uh, it was a guild challenge. Uh, the gal that was organizing it had a stack of cards. We drew them randomly. I drew a Chinese painting, which was not very weaverly. But what I did is I put the, uh, I did an analysis of the colors and the, and the um, proportions that the colors were in. And then I translated those to my warp. So the warp is in the same order and proportion as the paintings. And then I did that with the weft as well. So it's not really a plaid because of course the areas and the weft are bigger than the warp, but I really like the way that the colors change over the, uh, the shawl. The next uh, is a scarf that was also a, from fall colors. This time it was in, Vir in going to Virginia a couple of years ago. And, and there, there were a lot of uh, trees with uh, wonderful brown chocolate um, trunks and uh, yellow leaves that it was windy, so the leaves um, moved. And I, like, I tried to capture that in this uh, extended pointed twill. My friend Candy Spursum is a glass uh, maker, and she gave me this bowl as a gift. And once she gave me the bowl, I knew that I had to capture that in a table runner. So I wove the table runner, and now the table runner and bowl sit on their side table, uh, side cupboard in our dining room. In 2017, we found out that Mississippi was not going to have a total sun eclipse. So we traveled to Kentucky to see it. And it was great fun because it was a field full of people all waiting for the, for the two minutes and few seconds of total darkness. So when I came home, I um, designed and wove this, uh, this scarf, starting with this, the sun, a little bit of darkness, a little bit of darkness until it became total darkness. And the one to the right, is actually the, um, the Tamikula uh, shawl. You can see the blues from the mountains and the, the, uh, the stripes from the um, balloons and the um, colors of the, of the vineyards coming through them. These inspirations, uh, the inspiration pieces are always um, remind me of happy thoughts of these travels or people. And, um, but unfortunately not all um, times are happy. And like you, this year has not been a great year when it, it came to, um, to 
um, seeing friends and going places and certainly grateful for what HJ is doing now with this, allowing us to be connected. Um, one day, it looked like Mississippi was going to do well with COVID, but um, we didn't, of course. It's just impossible to, to run away from it. But there was one day that was particularly um, gloomy outside, and it was the day that we hit a very large number of cases and deaths. And it was, so it was very depressing. But I looked out of my window, and you can see the window from behind me there, and um, there was a rainbow. And so I thought, even in the dark, there is a rainbow. So I wove it, actually, it's just coming off the loom, um, so you can see the colors of the rainbow on a, a black background and silk. So after we um, make, I make those decisions, then I have to translate those decisions to cloth. So tune in on Sunday um, at 11, uh, 11 p.m. Well, no, I say 11 p.m. That should be 11 a.m. We will discuss uh, the details of this. How to go from uh, these general ideas to um, the unique uh, ways of making a project. I thank you for your attention. Uh, there is my contact information. Feel free to contact me. And uh, thank you again. Thank you so much, Marcy. What a wonderful presentation. And as Marcy said, she will be back with us on Sunday at 1 p.m. for that installment of Thread Talks. So if you're not already registered, please make sure you register then. Um, next up, we have Susan Lazier back with us. She will be speaking on understanding key measurements for success in creating clothing. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Susan. Okay, just confirm that you see a PowerPoint. Yes? Yes, we see your PowerPoint. Okay, great. All right. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Susan Lazier. I'm from the San Diego area. I am a professor of fashion at San Diego Mesa College, uh, semi-retired now. And I'm also the artistic director and software designer for Cochino Design Studio. So I, I design a, a pattern making program. Both of my career entities here have required that I get to know and understand taking measurements. And over the years, I've, I've measured with or for, I want to say thousands of people, actually, if you count all the students over the years, too. So let's talk about this. I take a few differently. There was an article in Threads magazine called Where is My Waste? If you subscribe to that, I went through a lot of this. But let's begin. So I always think before you even start to measure, you should kind of take an inventory and sit down and think about what ready to wear size or pattern do I usually buy? What are my known figured faults? What are my typical fitting problems? Because it's the figure faults and fitting problems and alterations that are kind of pointing fingers at the measurements that you need to be really aware of because those are the measurements that cause you grief in buying ready to wear clothing or working with standard sizes in sewing patterns. Um, I like to use a few different tools. I'll walk through these real quickly. So this is a measuring tape um, by a woman in San Diego, also Lorraine Henry. She is a fitting expert and she came up with this tape. There's two tapes actually. But what I like about it is that it has a zero point in the middle of one of the tapes. And you'll see how the second tape comes in later and you'll see how I use this. This is another tool. Uh, we import this from Germany. My distributor over there invented this ruler and it's great for taking certain measurements. It's also great for um, measuring off clothing, which you can use to help you understand how you'd like your clothes to fit. And you'll see me use it as well. You should have yarn and cord, maybe to tie around your waist. You're either gonna use a water soluble pen and dots to mark key parts of your body. Thin tape is good too. Um, the clothing that you should wear is something fairly fitted and with the proper bra because your bust measurements will change according to the bra. Um, and then you want to mark some key areas. So here we're marking the model's high shoulder point. This is like the very most fitted round neck you would ever wear and centered to your shoulder seam line. But everything hangs from that point and a lot of things are measured from that point. So it pays to find that. And I'm just gonna say it's where you would wear your most fitted neckline um, because it's a reference point that you're going to use. 
uh, usually the back of your ear on most people helps to find the center of your body. So you can see we're following along uh, the model and when we're marking where her shoulder seam would be. And you can see we've even used that to come down the side seam there so we can get a sense of where that would be. And then it's always good to take, you know, these, of course, these measurements, the way I'm explaining them, do take a partner to help you. Uh, husbands are not always the best, some are, uh, but usually someone who understands measurements or the need for good measurements is a good person to help. Uh, so you can mark your side seam. And I will point out that this is only necessary if you want front versus back measurements. And we'll talk again about that. So this is the measurement chart that we use in Garment Designer to collect 36 different measurements, plus two more for pants. Um, it, you know, you certainly don't need that. You can start with 12 measurements, which fixes a lot, but not everything. It won't have front versus back differences, but if you have these measurements right, you'll have decent success in fairly non-fitted styles. And then of course, when you're going into more fitted styles, you wanna be taking some or, or figure you're correct, you know, having to do pattern alteration because you are not, uh, the perfect size and you are not symmetrical. Um, you know, if you take a front versus back measurement, that helps you know that the front pattern is going to be wider than the back, etc. Sometimes you need to take left versus right measurements if you have a high shoulder or your bust depth is different. Uh, so just know that there's time. So let's talk about measuring. There's circumference measurements. Everyone knows you take your bust parallel to the floor and bra makes a difference. So we're just setting up to do that. But if you wanna do separate front versus back measurements, my tip is if you're just using a single tape, start at the side seam, run the tape all the way around, all the way around to come over and then you have a total measurement and then go read it on the other side and you can get the front versus back and you know that the two add up to the total. Or if you have this type of tape, you can start with the zero and then when you pinch it here, you get the front versus back measurement. Waist circumference, this is one that I don't necessarily take like everybody else. Uh, they always say that your waist is where the narrowest part is, but I'm saying your waist is where you say it is because as I have aged and as other women have aged, we fill in in different spots and the small of our waist moves. So I'm, I say my waist is in and around my belly button and it might be a bigger measurement, but that's where I want to wear my clothes. And I have that control because I control the size of the elastic or the waistband length. Uh, so I can actually control and indeed I'm short waisted. So sometimes I actually make my waist appear an inch below where my body's belly button is to balance out my figure. So you have control over that waist measurement. You know, sometimes it's not parallel to the floor, but if you tie a string and sometimes even tape the string down, as you can see we did here, um, so it doesn't move okay, around on you. Okay, right. so that was a video. Uh, if you are making bottoms or pants and you want a lowered waist, then you might want to take the waist measurement in two spots. Um, your full hip circumference, uh, usually it's the big, I say it's the biggest point between your waist and your knees. Um, on a Missy's, um, this would be seven inches, a petite, seven inches beneath the waist. On Missy's, nine inches beneath the waist. But when you take this measurement, so you take a few to figure out where the biggest one is, and that is your hip. But you really need to pay attention to the depth at which you took that. So I'm just going to slide into garment designer here and let me just put a bottom on. Because what usually happens if you're, you know, if you're using standard sizing, um, the, when you hit the full hip, uh, let's say on a pair of pants, it starts to taper inwards. So I'm a petite height, but my full hip is at 10 inches. So the problem I've usually had in ready to wear clothing and patterns is uh, the pattern is coming in and I'm still going out. So by being able to control the hip depth um, of the, and I'm just looking for it here, uh, back waist here. You know, if by making this be 10, you can see um, this just lowered. And therefore, the curve on the side seam curves out to my full hip. So you may need to recurve 
the hip on bottoms, if your hip depth is at a lower point than, or a higher point, you're just different from the patterns. Uh, sometimes you may, we usually mark these, and you, some people like to take a, a, a halfway between measurement just for records. Uh, if you have a tummy, you may want to hold something rigid, like a yardstick or a ruler, out and include that in the measurements. It will make your hip measurement be bigger, but uh, skirts will not cup in uh, beneath your tummy, which actually accentuates it. So let's look at some shoulder and armhole measurements. This is a neck width. I think everybody should know what their most fitted neck width would be. So if you can take two rulers and measure the width across, or this is how we use the hearth ruler. And it's just really good to know, I will never wear anything tighter than that. Uh, and that defines your high shoulder point and your neck width. Your shoulder width is kind of a, an interesting one because you, get, you can actually play a little with this one. You want the end of your shoulder that's gonna define your armholes to be a, still on what I call the plateau, not falling off the cliff, because a set in sleeve needs something to set upon. If you're very broad shouldered, you may even wanna move it in a little from what your body would say, so that it forms a nice line with the armhole and doesn't make your shoulders appear so broad. So there's a little wiggle room in this, but I, there's no wiggle as far as I'm concerned with not having a plateau for the sleeve. You don't want it falling off your shoulder line. Um, I, I'll just point out too that most people measure an inch bigger on the back than they do on the front. If you're taking custom measurements, the difference comes out in the width of the neckline. The back neckline's wider than the front. And as uh, women age or there's you know, accidents or, or just poor posture, uh, the back could be two inches bigger than the front. So you, being aware of that helps you fix your clothes. So these are just taking shoulder width. Um, you may want to take your upper chest width, but I've always found that people, this is a hard one for people to take. It's where that crease is, where your sleeve would be at its narrowest and measuring across. But as a general rule, um, if I was 15 on my shoulders, I would expect this to be three quarters of an inch less, angling in three eighths of an inch on each side. There's a, a play between the visual aesthetic and the reality. So I always just make it be three quarters of an inch different than my shoulders and I get a nice armhole. There may be other factors that come into play, but that's just my guide. Shoulder seams should be from the high point you establish to that point uh, where you're gonna call your armhole established and you would know the length of a shoulder seam. Uh, and I do wanna point out that when I'm in here, let's just go back up to tops. Um, your body shoulder seam and the garment shoulder seam length are not always the same thing. So as you, you know, are using different neckline styles, what happens is the shoulder seam moves up and down the slope. So if you were measure, if you knew your shoulders, uh, you know, seam was a certain length and then the pattern's not that length, well, a lot of that will depend on the next style that you're working with because that's what next styles do. They slide up and down that shoulder slope to help define the style. Um, so here we're just doing the length. This is a measurement I take different than, uh, differently than almost every pattern making book, et cetera. They will have you measure from center front up over your bosom to the slope point. I mean, the end of your shoulder point. And I have just watched so many students struggle with this and it would take us a month to get a block that worked for them. To me, this is a very visual measurement. You hold something rigid out from parallel to the floor from your high shoulder point and you measure the depth. In essence, it's half a dart. And so you wanna be careful with this one because if, if your pattern, let's just say the pattern that you're making is like this and you're slopier, um, it's going to introduce folds down here. And let's just say uh, your square there and not so slopey, but the pattern, it doesn't agree. Now that's gonna hike the armhole up. So I think this is a very important one to know and understand in relationship also to the next style that you're using. Armhole depth is another measurement I take differently than everybody else. I don't do it running around the armhole because it's such a complicated one to know where that armhole is. I want to know what is your body's physical armhole depth. So you can slide too rigid, like a ruler or something down there, and you're just measuring the vertical depth. Most women measure between five and six inches. If you're short-waisted or petite, you're probably closer to the five. 
Uh, and if you're tall and long-waisted, uh, you're probably closer to the six. You know, you can go a little above that and a little below the five, too. Um, most armholes, you know, will drop. So dependent upon the style. So this is an average fit. I go to very fitted. You see, it's still lower than the bodies. And so I always suggest really go pay, you know, get a favorite garment out and measure its armhole depth. And then you know what you like. But I think it's really good to know what yours is. If you want to put your darts for the bust in the right place, you need to measure from high shoulder down to bust level. And that just falls along your body, just like the cloth would. And then you also will measure tip to tip, you know, the, to get the span of yourself. And there's the tip to tip. And then you know where to put your darts in the right place. Back waist length is always helpful to know, but make sure you're measuring to the same waist level. Usually anyone over 16 inches is considered long-waisted. Anyone less than uh, 15 inches is considered short-waisted. Um, now this is a measurement that's not always taken, but uh, I think this is a very good measurement to take. You take it from your high shoulder point down along the body and then let it drop from the bust down and measure at the waist level. And then you do the same thing on the back. And then you compare the two numbers and usually the front is longer than the back. That's telling you uh, how much longer you might wanna make your front in order for it to hang parallel to the floor. So I have a style here. And if I find that, the, um, that I have a, a one inch difference, then what I would do is I would grab my front and move it down one inch um, and then just smooth the curve out if I want to smooth out the curve on my paper pattern or whatever you're using. Side seems still the same, but this is going to balance out better. The garment's going to hang parallel. So that high shoulder to bust measurement is important. So you can see that we're taking it there and reading it. Additional bottom measurements, you may want to do crotch depth. Um, most clothing or pant crotch depths are at, at least a quarter inch or half inch longer than your body, and that would be a pair of tight fitting blue jeans or leggings maybe. Uh, Palazzo pants might be two inches deeper, so you can sit down and measure the crotch depth. Um, crotch length will help you in doing pants, so you're going to measure from the center front down through the center of your crotch and back up to the back, and you want the separate measurement, the front versus the back. This is, um, you know, where this tape comes in helpful too. You can put the zero in the center, and the other thing about this tape set is that this, they have a second tape that strings onto the first tape. So while you're measuring the crotch length, you can also measure inseam down to the floor. Um, I think thigh circumference is uh, maybe an important one for doing pants for some people. So you may wanna pay attention to that. And just the last few, uh, when you measure your arm length, you're measuring from that same point you defined. I usually measure over a bit, slightly bent elbow um, you can see if my arm was straight, I'd measure 21. If I slightly bent my elbow, I measure 22. And if I really bend my elbow, I measure 23. I think our most common stance is the one in the middle, but people who work at a desk all the time might want to take that measurement with their arm fully bent. So you can see taking that. And then upper arm circumference is uh, potentially important because um, there is a relationship between your body's armhole circumference and armhole depth. And so if you tend to be full here, but you're short waisted and have a fairly short armhole, you may actually have to lower your armhole to accommodate the sleeve that needs to be wider because of your upper arm circumference and therefore has more perimeter that you wouldn't normally get enough in a, a higher armhole. So there is a relationship between those. You can see if um, you know, I'm raising my armhole and the sleeve is updating, but uh, you know, we have a pattern smarts between armholes and sleeves, but if you're making changes over here, certainly the software will know if you, know, you put that in. Uh, if you put in your armhole depth, it knows all of this and it knows your bicep and it will flag. Um, okay, so I think I've just got one more. I suggest you make a basic me pattern. And this is you kind of in a flattened mode. And it would be the equivalent of this green here. We call it a sloper. And then print it out full scale or draft it full scale and lay this inside any pattern that you're planning to make. And you will see the relationship between you 
and the pattern and you will know what it is that you need to do. Um, so in wrapping up, uh, we have a couple specials on a few of those products. You can find them in the vendor store. And tomorrow uh, in the vendor hall at 12.30 p.m., I'm doing a demo of the software. If you're interested in that, it's called Garment Designer, Windows and Mac. So that's my take on measurements. Uh, I do some differently and it's based on experience over the years and I hope you got something out of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Wonderful presentation. And as Susan shared, she will be joining us again tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time in the Marketplace Live and she will be going over her garment design software that you saw a little bit in that presentation. Next, we're going to have Mimi Foster come up with us, and she is going to give us a little history of the alpaca. Good afternoon, everybody. Mimi Foster here from Melody Lane Farm. I will share out my screen today with you. I was talking Wednesday a little bit about our farm and what we do with our fiber. Today, I'm going to give you a history on, our, on the alpaca. A lot of times when people come to our farm, they want to know why we have alpacas and what do we do with them. So before I get started, I'm just going to give you our information again about our um, email, our cell phone. We're located on facebook.com under Melody Lane Farm. Um, feel free if you want to talk to us about setting up a farm with alpacas, services that we offer, boarding, animal sales, breedings, classes. We do do consulting. We have a beautiful farm store and farm tours. So let's get started. The alpaca is actually in the camelid family. That includes a llama, a wild alpaca called a vicuña, and another one called a guanaco. The uh, alpaca is actually able to not have to drink a lot of water because they are in the camelid family. The two kinds of alpacas that we have mostly here in the United States are the Wakaya and the Surrey. And I will show you photographs of what they are in a few moments. They're from South America in Chile, Peru, and Bolivia. The llama was considered a beast of burden because it was much larger, weighed more, and could carry heavier packets and, and people. The uh, alpaca itself was basically for fiber. The alpaca was actually discovered by the Inca Indians over 5,000 years ago, and it was the oldest domesticated livestock at that time. It was used by the Inca Indians as royalty for clothing, food, and religious ceremonies. The Inca Indians began to fade away as the wars began, and so did the alpaca. But in the 1800s, Sir Titus Salt rediscovered the alpaca, and it was at a time when the new textile industry was taking its biggest height at that time. So they were captured once a year. They were corralled from the mountains and brought down from the mountains and shorn for their fiber. The alpaca fleece is actually stronger than wool. It's seven times warmer than wool, soft and lustrous, hypoallergenic and waterproof. The center of the alpaca industry is basically in Peru even today. The United States is doing great strides with the fiber mills and the animals and we're really doing a fine job. There were three imports of the alpacas into the United States. However, the last import was in 1984 when the United States closed the borders to um, additional alpacas. The reason they did that was because they wanted to stay born and raised in the United States and start our own industry, which we're doing very well with. The alpaca is actually a very gentle and curious animal. They're very easy to handle. We breed them once a year and the gestation period is 10 and a half months to 12 months. They have a single birth or the baby is actually called a crea per year. Twins are not normally had. We have heard that some do survive, but most do not because of the way that the animal lays inside the mother. A normal birth with the crea or baby 
is basically standing and nursing from the mother within 30 minutes with no glitches or possible problems happening. We wean the baby or Kriya at five or six months old or when the baby reaches 60 pounds. They are herd animals and they usually need two for companionship. And believe me, they know who their family is. They know their mother, their father, their sister, and their brother. They remember. For an alpaca, it's very easy to um, house them. If you don't have a barn, all you need is a three-sided shelter to protect them from the wind and make sure that you have hay and plenty of water. The alpaca does have four teeth on the bottom and a hard palate on the top. They have insidious teeth, which means that they continuously grow. They eat grass, orchard hay, and grain and make sure that we have fresh water. Good husbandry is always, always a good healthy alpaca. Good husbandry consists of plenty of air and space, water and food. They do not destroy your pasture with feeding or eating or with their feet as horses, sheep and goats do. The nice thing is they have a community poop pile and that is very nice because we can go out to our pasture every day and go directly to the same spot. And the reason they do that, the female wants her current scent on top or the male wants her, his current scent on top in case they're close by and in the vicinity. So it's very easy to clean up and they're in bean format, unlike trying to find your dog or your horse when you have to walk around and look for it. They're very hardy animals and they're healthy. So that keeps down the vet care lifespan of the alpaca is anywhere from 17 to 22 years. We just put our first, our very first alpaca, if you were on the uh, website Wednesday, we put her down uh, last July. Her name was Mercedes and she was 17 years old. She gave us seven babies. She was a wonderful mother and she was just the best alpaca. They have soft padded feet with two toes. So that's one reason why they don't rip up your pasture and your grass. And uh, they're maintained twice a year with their toenails and their teeth. So twice a year we have two gentlemen come out to our farm and they trim the, the toes and the teeth. Alpacas chew their cud like a cow. They have three stomachs. And the reason that they have three stomachs and uh, the, unlike a cow who has four, they create very good energy for themselves because when they eat their food, the food goes down and up, down and up, down and up, and then eventually they dispel it from the back. But by chewing your cud, it gives them great energy for themselves. They adapt to the climate very well. However, it seems like our summers are getting hotter and our winters are getting colder. Um, they're still doing quite well in the winter when it's very, very cold here in Ohio. Um, an alpaca can get up from a cushed position and it will be all melted up from underneath them. They keep all of their heat in their stomach. You can have five to 10 alpacas easily on one acre of land. Of course, you wanna make sure that the one acre that you have is good grass, not grass and mostly dirt, but good grass. You need at least five feet tall of no climb fencing to keep the predators away. And since we've had our farm in 2008, we have never had an issue with predators. Alpaca manure is very rich fertilizer for fruits and vegetables. It's organic, it can be liquefied. We have many, many people come to our farm and take the alpaca beans. You do not have to wait uh, like you do on horse manure with heat to apply it to your gardens. Alpaca will cush or lay down to sleep or be transported. The alpaca comes in 22 natural colors. The weight of the alpaca can range from anywhere from 100 to 180 pounds. Again, they can be transported in a van or trailer as they're cushed. They ride very comfortably. They are easy to train with the halter. They do understand commands 
and they do understand hand signals which is one reason in the shell ring, there's many young kids from ages three all the way up that are in competitions with the animals because they're so easily trained. The alpaca brings a very attractive business and farming opportunity to anyone who would like to start an alpaca career. Uh, there's many write-offs for that. So whether you adjust, which is boarding your animal, or whether you have the property and you own the animals, it's a very attractive write-off. There's all types of alpaca owners from doctors, advisors, educators, part-time people that work. Um, myself, my husband and I worked full-time while we started our business and um, retirees. So you're looking at a wakaya and that word is H-U-A-C-A-Y-A wakaya, and you can see that it's more of a teddy bear type of animal. The fiber is shorter, it's closer together, and the, the crimp is, is closer. You can see this one up close. So she's got more of a teddy bear type. This is called the top knot on the top of the head. This is a baby or crea alpaca. And again, the top of the head, the coloring. This was actually a true black, true black male. And you could see that there's black on the ears and the nose and throughout the body in different shades. This is a Surrey. Surreys are wonderful alpacas and we do have many in the United States. However, they're a little bit more high maintenance with keeping out the vegetation and the dirt on the, on the uh, fiber but it spins wonderful, it's like silk, it's absolutely beautiful. Here's another photo of a Surrey that you can see, and you can see some of the vegetation in the fiber. So it is a little bit higher maintenance, they're beautiful animals, but um, we chose the wakaya. We get our hay, which is pure orchard hay once a year. So they actually bring the wagons, they put it on the elevator, and they stack it for us up in our loft. This is the largest textile mill in Peru, one building out of three. All fiber that's brought in on semi trucks. Very high end fashion throughout the world, Europe, United States, high end alpaca, high end alpaca. This is an alpaca in Peru. Now, sometimes they don't shear the animal uh, every year like we do because they are from the mountains and the weather is so different. They might wait two or three years because of the uh, quantity of fiber that they'll get off the animal. This is Machu Picchu where the Inca Indians actually built their village on the top of the mountain. And they had the alpacas and the llamas spread throughout the mountains as they were building their villages. It's another very interesting history. And I would like to wish you a, a very nice fall. Libby would like to wish you from Melody Lane Farm a very cold winter. Maestro would like to wish you a very nice winter and holiday. Maraca also. And our neighbor's horses. And once again, keep in mind that alpaca is a lifestyle. And if anyone is interested in calling for information or any type of uh, inquiry, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much for listening and I've really enjoyed working with hand weavers. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, we learned a lot about alpaca this week and we appreciate you sharing those, that information. Thank and you, thank you all much, for attending this week's or this hour's installment of Thread Talks. Next up at 4 p.m. Eastern, jump over to our panel discussion on our Certificate of Excellence program. We'll see you there. Thanks, everyone.